Hey everybody, welcome to The Man Leak. I'm John as always, and it's time for the final day of Theros Beyond Death set review. We're going to talk about all the multicolored cards, all the non-colored cards, and all of the land cards today. We have just about as many cards as we've had in the previous day's videos, but these ones have more text, so this video could potentially be a little tiny bit longer, but let's get started with Acolyte of Affliction. Acolyte of Affliction is two black green for a creature human cleric at Uncommon. It's a 2-3. When Acolyte of Affliction enters the battlefield, put the top two cards of your library into your graveyard. Then you may return a permanent card from your graveyard to your hand. This card's great, like Golgari Finebroker, Nullhide Bailoth, etc. It's very powerful and has the chance to be undervalued by those who aren't aware at the start of the format just how good these kind of cards are. This is exactly what Black Green wants to be doing and could even be first pickable after removal. Seems like a very, very, very solid B, possibly even in the B plus range, I think as a 2-3, we're going to have to keep it as a B. I think Golgari Fine Broker being a 3-4 was a little tiny bit better. But yeah, the fact that you just mill a little bit and then you return whatever you want out of your, uh, out of your graveyard, uh, assuming what you want is not an instant or sorcery, of course. Um, yeah, I think Accolade of Affliction is a strong B. It is a great card for every black green deck. Up next is Allure of the Unknown. Allure of the Unknown is three black red for a sorcery at rare. Reveal the top six cards of your library. An opponent exiles a non-land card from among them. Then you put the rest into your hand. That opponent may cast the exiled card without paying its mana cost. I hate this card. I think it's horrible. You give your opponent the best card of your top six. You have to pay five mana to do that, and they get the best card for free and then you get five other random cards, of which an amount is definitely gonna be some lands. I just super don't want that. I, I'm, I'm not in the market for giving my opponent one of the best cards out of the top fifth of my deck. That just sounds horrible. Uh, I don't ever really wanna play this card. I'm not gonna pick it. Uh, until I find out differently, this is just not a card I'm willing to play. I have this at an F. Up next is Ashiok Nightmare Muse. Ashiok Nightmare Muse is three blue black for a legendary planeswalker Ashiok at Mythic. Uh, Ashiok starts with five loyalty plus one create a two three blue and black nightmare creature token with whenever this creature attacks or blocks each opponent exiles the top two cards of their library. Minus three return target non land permanent to its owner's hand then that player exiles a card from their hand. Minus seven you may cast up to three face up cards your opponents own from exile with without paying their mana costs. Ashiok is a fantastic five mana planeswalker. Uh, they protect themselves with a two three, which is amazing. If that two three can attack, it has very real value behind it. Bouncing a creature and hurting your opponent's hand is awesome. Hopefully their hand's empty. You bounce it, they have to exile that card. And then Ashiok's ultimate is crazy if you have anything in their exile zone from the two threes, from the minus three ability. If your opponent exiled anything for any reason, like escaping, you can cast those cards. Ashiok just seems amazing. I think realistically, I'm only using Ashiok's first two abilities unless the third ability is gonna give me something that is just going to, you know, blow the game wide open. But even if Ashiok didn't have this ultimate, they would be an incredible Planeswalker. Easy A+, first pick in every pack they're in. Just fantastic card. Up next is Atris, Oracle of Half-Truths. Atris is two blue black for a legendary creature human advisor at rare. There are three two with menace. When Atris, Oracle of Half-Truths, enters the battlefield, target opponent looks at the top three cards of your library and separates them into a face down pile and a face up pile. Put one pile into your hand and the other into your graveyard. This is obviously a little bit overcosted as a 3-2 menace, but the ability more than makes up for that. Splitting piles is always super challenging. It's one thing that even some of the best players can really screw up sometimes, uh, but having to choose between the unknown pile and the known pile is definitely a little bit of a pain. Realistically, I think most po opponents will always just do the best card in a pile of one, and the other two cards in a pile of two, whether they show you one face up or face down is gonna be up to them. And then you have to play this game of, is my opponent just doing that? Is my opponent 
doing the opposite of that, thinking that I think they are doing that? Is my opponent doing the opposite of the opposite of that, thinking that I know what they're thinking, that I'm thinking that I know what they're thinking? Um, there, there's so many levels to this. And yeah, I think I'm always going to take the one card. Um, I'll get got by it sometimes, but I feel like the one card's got to be the, uh, the safest bet. But I think the card looks really fun. I think it's like a B plus. It's obviously not a crazy bomb. It's not going to get into the A range, but I think it's a very good card. B plus for Atris. Up next is Bronze Hide Lion. Bronze Hide Lion is green white for a creature cat at rare. It's a 3 3. Pay green white. Bronze Hide Lion gains indestructible until end of turn. When Bronze Hide Lion dies, return it to the battlefield. It's an aura enchantment with enchant creature you control and green white. Enchanted creature gains indestructible until end of turn and it loses all other abilities. This seems super playable. A 3 3 for 2 is obviously great. It can be indestructible for a very cheap cost. And if it does die, getting to make something else indestructible on command, I love it. Plus, it's dangerous enough to justify removal, but hey, your opponent just spent removal on a 2 drop. Sucks to be them. Very solid B, just not quite any higher because at the end of the day, it's a 3 3. Um, but yeah, B for Bronze Hide looks really fun. I think I slightly prefer Fleece Main Lion, which this of course is very similar to from original Theros, but B plus for Bronze Hide Lion. Up next is Calyx, Destiny's Hand. Calyx is two green white for a legendary planeswalker. Calyx at Mythic, he starts with four loyalty. Plus one, look at the top four cards of your library. You may reveal an enchantment card from among them and put that card into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Minus three, exile target creature or enchantment you don't control until target enchantment you control leaves the battlefield. So you basically turn an enchantment on the battlefield into a banishing light. You, you can turn your banishing light into a second banishing light if you want. Minus seven, return all enchantment cards from your graveyard to the battlefield. Calyx is fine, but that's about it. Green white should be pretty enchantment heavy, so his plus one should draw you a card most of the time. His minus three generally should be active, and I really love that design. I really love the design of turning something into an oblivion ring. Uh, his minus seven is probably not going to be too great in limited. It's not like your purposely rapidly filling your library or your graveyard up with powerful enchantment cards and so ultimating him and getting back you know a couple of little early enchantment creatures and like an aura or something isn't really that good but ultimately he feels like a a, a very b planeswalker in limited you know he's not gonna warp the game he doesn't essentially guarantee that you've won when he comes down he's kind of like kaya except Definitely more playable and limited than Kaya was. Uh, a B for Calyx. Nothing higher, just a B. Up next is Dalakos, Crafter of Wonders. Dalakos, Crafter of Wonders is one blue-red for a legendary creature, Merfolk Artificer at rare. It's a 2-4. Tap to add colorless, colorless, but spend this mana only to cast artifact spells or activate abilities of artifacts. Equipped creatures you control have flying and haste. This set has some of the fewest artifacts we've seen in a long time. Which, by the way, I'm super happy with. I really hate when sets have way too many crap artifacts in them because it clogs up limited packs. You know, we've got, I think, like nine or ten artifacts to look at in this set, and, that, and that's a good number. But that means that Delicose isn't really doing anything. A lot of the artifacts, as we'll see very shortly, aren't amazing. So being able to ramp them out earlier doesn't really matter, and you're not equipping your creatures really. So Dalakos is a vanilla 2-4 for 3, which is like a C-. minus. You'll play it if you need a creature, and that's about it. And in fact, it's a hard to cast 2-4, so it, it probably just drops into the D range. D for Dalakos. Up next is Devourer of Memory. Devourer of Memory is blue-black for a creature nightmare at uncommon. It's a 2-1. Whenever one or more cards are put into your graveyard from your library, Devourer of Memory gets plus one, plus one until end of turn and can't be blocked this turn. Pay one black blue, put the top card of your library into your graveyard, thereby triggering what I just said, that first ability. Devourer of Memory looks pretty darn good. The fact that this doesn't keep the count or doesn't keep the buff hurts. I really wish that this just got bigger as things milled in. But of course, at that point, it would have to be a rare. It would have to be a little bit more expensive. Uh, but it gives me visions of uh, that old centipede from the Demir in Gate Crash, I think it was. I don't think I'm making that card up anyways. Uh, but yeah, this of course is still gonna be a totally big game here because of that unblockable especially. This definitely represents three damage a turn and self milling one card is 100% upside in the blue black deck. You know, it's not like you're milling three and you can only activate this, you know, 
a handful of times before you start to get too low of your library. You can activate this as much as you want in every game. Being an X1 might be a problem. There is a decent amount of X1 hate, but of course, if you have three mana up and one is blue and one is black, your opponent can't attack this with, you know, something that does one damage or such. Uh, but of course, something like Mogus's Favor or whatever that plus two minus one card is would still kill this. But this is still just a totally fine card in the blue-black deck. It's just going to be some nice inevitability, a nice way to close out the game. I have Devourer of Memory at a solid B. Up next is Dream Trawler. Dream Trawler is two white, white, blue, blue. For a creature Sphinx at rare, it's a 3-5 flying lifelink. Whenever you draw a card, Dream Trawler gets plus one, plus O oh, until end of turn. And of course, that's going to happen every turn when you draw your card for the turn. Whenever Dream Trawler attacks, draw a card. Hey, a second card, meaning this attacks as a 5-5. Five, five. Discard a card. And you've drawn two this turn if you've attacked with it. Dream Trawler gains Hexproof until end of turn. Tap it. This card is amazing. You obviously must be white-blue. You cannot splash this card. You should not. You cannot splash this card. So, so, so don't let me catch you doing that. But if you are in white-blue, this is an incredibly good card. Six mana for a 5-5 five, five flying lifelink that is going to be obnoxious to kill is an amazing card. This will be a massive groan tester when it comes down. It is going to end games. It is going to see standard play. I'm relatively confident in that. But in limited, this is just a straight-up bomb. Uh, I will pick this, and I will... Uh, immediately get married to blue white and then try my best to force my way into that and of course if you're blue white and you open this pack three or get past it because nobody else should be picking this if they're not blue white is going to be an amazing payoff for blue white i think dream trawler is a solid solid a we're not going to go to a plus because as amazing as this card is there's no flexibility to it you have one choice of what deck you can be in uh, but yeah solid a for dream trawler this thing is amazing up next is Enigmatic Incarnation. Enigmatic Incarnation is two green blue for an enchantment at rare. At the beginning of your end step, you may sacrifice another enchantment. If you do, search your library for a creature card with converted mana cost equal to one plus the sacrificed enchantment's converted mana cost. Put that card onto the battlefield, then shuffle your library. No thanks. I have little to no interest in this. This causes way too much setup and way too much knowledge of what's in your deck is required. The perfect scenario where you have, you know, the three drop that you don't want on the battlefield and the four drop that you want, you A, know it's in your deck, B, it's still in your deck, you haven't drawn it yet, and whether you can sack that to get up to five, there, there's just way too much going on here. Neoform was not good in limited. Vanifar was not really that good in limited. This is not going to be that good in limited. Play it elsewhere. Have your fun. Don't play this in limited. It's an F. It's way too hard to set up. You're taking turn four off to play this and hopefully getting to activate it at the end of that turn, but that's going to require that you have an enchantment on the battlefield. You probably will, but you may not. There's too much here that makes this just a dead card. So F for Enigmatic Incarnation, I expect to literally never, ever cast it. Up next is Eutropia the Twice Favored. Eutropia the Twice Favored is one green blue for a legendary creature human wizard at Uncommon. She's a 2-2 with Constellation. Whenever another enchantment enters the battlefield under your control, put a plus one, plus one counter on target creature. That creature gains flying until end of turn. This seems like a great constellation payoff. A counter is very real. Flying makes that creature a very real threat that turn. Seems absolutely stellar, very splashable in the green-white deck. I would 100% put Utropia in every green-white deck in three islands. Try and stop me. And because she's green, this means like your big beefy green creatures can suddenly be beefier and flying, and that's terrifying. I think Eutropia is a solid B+. She takes a little bit of work to get going because, of course, you need to have enchantments ready to trigger the constellation, but it's not too much of a setup. So B+, for Eutropia, she looks incredible. Up next is Gallia of the Endless Dance. Gallia of the Endless Dance is red-green for a legendary creature satyr at rare. She's a 2-2 with haste. Other satyrs you control get plus one, plus one, and have haste. Whenever you attack with three or more creatures, you may discard a card at random. If you do, draw two cards. So there are four red-green satyrs at common. There are four at uncommon. There's, of course, uh, satyrs something or other, the, the spell that makes a satyr. 
that means that you can actually get some pretty decent value off of her Lord ability here. Especially since almost all of those satyrs are pretty darn playable. Getting to pitch a random card, or not so random if you only have one, and then draw two whenever you attack with a bunch of creatures is just what Red Green wants as well. Gallia seems solid, but unfortunately does really only go in one single deck. I don't think you're splashing her in other decks. So I am going to keep her at like a B minus. She's not that bomby by herself. She requires some other stuff going on. I think she is good. You're obviously always playing her if you're these colors and you have her, but I do think she is like a B minus. So B minus for Gallia. Up next is Hactos the Onscarred. Hactos the Onscarred is red, red, white, white for a legendary creature, human warrior at rare. He's a 6 1. He attacks each combat if able. As Hactos enters the battlefield, choose 2, 3, or 4 at random. Hactos has protection from each converted mana cost other than the chosen number. That means that spells cannot target it unless it is a 2 or a 3 or a 4 drop spell. That means that creatures cannot block or deal damage to Hactos unless they are a two drop or a three drop or a four drop depending on which number was chosen hactos seems obnoxious it's hard to cast obviously you're gonna have to be red white um, but it's not that hard in a two color deck a lot of people look at this and they say oh it's really hard to cast you may not be able to get it down but it, it's not that hard in an even split deck and especially because hactos doesn't have to come down on four if hactos comes down on five just as good six just as good. Now, obviously, if your opponent has the silver bullet right from the get-go, this is going to feel awful. Your opponent has a two drop down and, you know, like a five drop or something. And you play this and you roll your die, you pick your random number and it comes up two. Cool. Hactos dies next turn because that two drop is just going to jump block him. That's going to suck. But in all the games where you drop Hactos and your opponent has a two drop and a three drop and a five drop and they have a great board state and suddenly you draw this and you pick four at random and congrats, you've got like a two, maybe three turn clock before they're dead. I'm really unhappy with this card being printed in the limited set. I think it's really, really, really awful for limited. The fact that this ranges so heavily from insane, uninteractable bomb to literal trash is just not what a good draft format should be um you know what this is a legendary creature put it in a brawl deck put it in you know any of these 17 million non-limited products that they're releasing with every single set these days don't put crap like this in the limited format Anyways, I have it as a B plus. I think there's just enough times where, you know, even if you, you know, roll the die and you hit a two and your opponent has a two drop, you still have a full turn to get rid of that two drop, at which point Hactos may still just become a six one unblockable. So B plus for Hactos, the times that he sucks are going to suck. And the times that he is insane are going to ruin games of magic. So B plus for Hactos, Wizards of the Coast, put this crap in supplemental products, not limited. Up next is Hero of the Nyxborn. Hero of the Nyxborn is one red white for an enchantment creature, human soldier at uncommon is a 2-2. When Hero of the Nyxborn enters the battlefield, create a 1-1 one, one white human soldier creature token. Whenever you cast a spell that targets Hero of Nyxborn, creatures you control get plus one plus oh until end of turn, because of course it's a hero. Totally fine included in the red white deck. It's a touch better than the two drop white hero, but not insanely so. Still, it's just what red white ordered and will be an auto include in multiples if possible. Just to be minus, of course, because you need to be attacking nonstop. And if you do stop attacking with this creature and uh, what's going on in the battlefield, then it looks a little bit less exciting. But a B minus for Hero of the Nyxborn. It is exactly what red white wants. Up next is Clothis, God of Destiny. Clothis, God of Destiny, is one red green for a legendary enchantment creature god at Mythic. She's a 4 5 indestructible as long as your devotion to red and green is less than 7. Clothis isn't a creature. At the beginning of your pre combat main phase, exile target card from a graveyard. If it was a land card, add red or green. Otherwise, you gain 2 life and Clothis deals 2 damage to each opponent. Clothis seems incredible, especially because she's only three mana. Getting to turn off your opponent's escape plans while also causing a four point life swing is great. And your creatures get to attack in kind of with impunity because they're either dealing combat damage or your opponent's blocking them and killing them. 
And then next pre-combat main phase, that creature turns into a four-point life swing. And if you're not doing that damage, you're getting a little bit of ramp. This is super what Red Green wants to do. Clothis doesn't care if she ever becomes a creature. I love Clothis. I think she is the most powerful of the six gods in this set. Uh, I think she's a strong A+. Super sold on Clothis. I think she is amazing. Up next is Kroxa, Titan of Death's Hunger. Kroxa is black red for a legendary creature, Elder Giant Mythic, and it's a 6-6 six, six for two. But when Kroxa enters the battlefield, sacrifice it unless it escaped. Whenever Kroxa enters the battlefield or attacks, each opponent discards a card, then each opponent who didn't discard a non-land card this way loses three life. Escape, black, black, red, red, exile five other cards. Kroxa seems really good, assuming that it is going to escape, of course. If you're never gonna escape it, I think you built your deck wrong, but it's less good if you do that. <laughs> Because yeah, black red to hit your opponent's hand is a little bit cute, but not terribly impactful. Though I do love that your opponent has to not discard a land, which is the default card that you always want to discard in order to not take three damage. But if you do ever escape with this, it's gonna be really hard to lose the game. A six six for four that causes a discard and attacks kind of like a nine six, um, assuming they are discarding a land or discarding nothing because their hand's empty is great. I think it's a first pick slam dunk A+. Kroxa is very, very, very good. Up next is Kuronos, Hound of Athreos. Kuronos is a one white black for a legendary creature hound at rare. It's a 3-3 with Vigilance, Menace, and Lifelink, one mechanic for each head. Creature cards in graveyards can't enter the battlefield. Players can't cast spells from graveyards. Kunaro seems pretty decent. Three mana, three, three with three relevant abilities is very good. Plus it turns off escape, which is pretty nifty. Uh, luckily with black, white, your plan is returning auras a little bit more than it is with creatures, but it is also about returning creatures. And this does mean that your own creatures can't enter the battlefield from the graveyard either. So do be aware this is symmetrical and might screw your own plans up a little bit as well. But hey, screwing your plans up for a 3-3 three, three for 3 with Menace, Lifelink, and Vigilance is not too bad. Your opponent will kill this uh, without too much waiting around and then your escape stuff is back turned on. So yeah, Kunaros looks like a solid B to me. I don't think I'm going to go quite any higher because it does actually kind of hurt uh, a chunk of Black White's plan. Up next is Mischievous Chimera. Mischievous Chimera is blue-red for an enchantment creature Chimera at Uncommon. It's a 2-2 flyer. Whenever you cast your first spell during each opponent's turn, Mischievous Chimera deals one damage to each opponent. Scry one. So this is the signpost uncommon payoff for blue-red. And I really had hoped that we were going to get something better. This card's fine. Like, this card's totally solid. It's a 2-2 flyer for two, which great that's that's really good stats and you know i'm not going to say no to dealing a damage to my opponent and scrying but i really wanted something more out of this blue red deck and because all the blue red payoffs just seem a little weak i'm real hesitant about that deck but obviously if you're in that deck or heading towards that deck this is going to be one of your better cards that you can get Unfortunately, I think it is still a B minus. You know, it is still a two mana two two flyer. Like we we cannot grade that poorly. Those are very good stats. And if you are blue red, you are going to be very happy to have this. But yeah, it, it's just weak compared to uh, some of the other stuff going on in this format. So B minus for mischievous chimera. I really wish this blue red deck looked better than it does. Up next is Pelucranos Unchained. Pelucranos is two black green for a legendary creature zombie Hydra at Mythic. It's a zero zero. It enters the battlefield with six plus one plus one counters on it. It escapes with 12 plus one plus one counters on it instead. If damage would be dealt to Pelucranos, well, it has a plus one plus one counter on it. Prevent that damage and remove that many plus one plus one counters from it. Pay one black green. Pelucranos fights another target creature. Interestingly, and this is probably unlikely to ever come up in limited at least fight spells are almost always another target creature your opponent controls this one's not pelucranos can fight your own stuff highly doubt that's ever going to be relevant but that is a, a, a big difference from most of cards like this and pelucranos escapes for four black green and exiling six other cards from your graveyard 
Poly K seems super solid. Four mana six six is obviously busted. Gets around Death Touch, which there is a decent dash of in this set. And fighting on command, and it will shrink, of course, womp womp, is all great. I'd love this card if it could never escape, but if you do escape with this, it's gotta be basically game over. The card's great, first pick it every time. A plus for Poly K. I think it looks great. Up next is Rise to Glory. Rise to Glory is three white black for a sorcery add on common. Choose one or both. Return target creature card from your graveyard to the battlefield. See, Kunros would turn that off. And or return target or a card from your graveyard to the battlefield. Interestingly, Kunros would not turn that part off. This is exactly what Black White wants to be doing. This is the Black White Uncommon Signpost card. There are so many aura removal spells like Myers Graft, Dreadful Apathy, Heliod's Punishment, etc., that will probably end up in your graveyard, and you can recur them with this, and that's fantastic. Getting back a creature as well, of course, is just solid. Now, if you're only doing one half of this card, it's a little bit expensive for what it's doing. Um, I'll really want to be returning two things with this every single time I cast it. Um, but, you know, there'll be cases where you just have to pay the five mana to return, you know, a Dreadful Apathy or something, and it'll be fine. Uh, but yeah, this looks exactly like what Bl uh, Black White wants to be doing. I think it's like a B. I don't know that I'd ever consider first picking it, but the second, you know, that I've picked up some of those aura removal, I will be jumping on this and jumping into Black White. So solid B for Rise to Glory. Up next is Siona, Captain of the Pileus. Siona is one green white for a legendary creature human soldier at Uncommon. She's a 2 2. When Siona enters the battlefield, look at the top seven cards of your library. You may reveal an aura card from among them and put it into your hand. Put the rest on the bottom of your library in a random order. Whenever an aura you control becomes attached to a creature you control, create a 1 1 white human soldier creature token. Seven is an awful lot to look at. Uh, if we're casting her on curve, she's looking at like something like 23% of your entire deck. So assuming you have auras, she should find one. The ideal, of course, is removal auras, because uh, a 2-2 two -two for three that draws removal is fantastic, but you'll take a buff aura if you, uh, if you don't have another choice. Getting a 1-1 one -one when you do aura something up is a nice little bonus, but super doesn't sell her for me, especially since the best white auras are going on your opponent's creatures, so you're not even getting that 1-1. One -one. Still seems like a totally okay card, but I think she's much more in the C-plus range than anything else. I'm not going to go up to B-minus just because I'm not enamored with getting a couple of random 1-1s. One -ones. I know some people love that, and they're just never impactful enough for me. So Siona, I think, is a C plus. I'm obviously never saying no to her if I'm in green white, but I'm also not really uh, going out of my way to pick her up. Up next is Slaughter Priest of Mogus. Slaughter Priest of Mogus is black red for a creature Minotaur Shaman at Uncommon. It's a 2-2. Whenever you sacrifice a permanent, Slaughter Priest of Mogus gets plus 2 plus 0 oh until end of turn. Pay 2, sacrifice another creature or an enchantment. Slaughter Priest of Mogus gains first strike until end of turn. Seems totally fine, and hopefully, you know, that black red sacrifice deck is going to be real because I'm super excited for it. It's one of my favorite draft archetypes. I think the last time we really had it was Ultimate Masters, or no, Masters 25, actually actually. Paying to sack sucks, but it's not too expensive here, just too generic. And this becoming a 4-2 first striker when you sack something is really good. All around solid limited card, probably doing exactly what black red needs to do. I think it's like an easy B once you're in those colors. I'm just not sure if it's strong enough for me to grab onto it quite early. So B for Slaughter Priest of Mogus. Up next is Staggering Insight. Staggering Insight is white blue for an enchantment aura at uncommon enchant creature. Enchanted creature gets plus one plus one and has lifelink and whenever this creature deals combat damage to a player, draw a card. This is a fine aura, plus one, plus one, lifelink, curiosity are all nice effects to have for only two mana. It turns any creature with evasion into much more of a must answer threat. So this is likely a very solid C plus, maybe even into the B minus range, but we'll see. I'm still very hesitant on oring things up. Yes, it's an archetype in this set. Yes, it helps trigger constellation, but putting auras on enchantment creatures, which you're going to have a bunch of those running around, seems like an awful idea with all the enchantment hate. There's a single mana bounce spell in this set and a fair amount of just normal removal for creatures. So I've got this at like a B minus, I think at max. Be careful with this. I think people are going to get way too greedy with their auras and they're going to get blown out left and right. And I am ready to do that to them. B minus for staggering insight.
Our second last gold card today is Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. Uro is one green blue for a legendary creature, Elder Giant Mythic. It's a 6-6. When it enters the battlefield, sacrifice it unless it escaped. Whenever Uro enters the battlefield or attacks, you gain three life and draw a card. Then you may put a land card from your hand onto the battlefield. Escape, green, green, blue, blue. Exile, five other cards. Uro seems pretty nice, but I do think that it is less good than Kroxa. Uh, it's Sorcery Speed Growth Spiral plus Healing Salve, which... It's fine, but it's not exciting. It's not lightning bolting my opponent's face. Once it escapes, that's when the fun begins. But the fun is still just rampant life, which are good things, but you, you need to do something with that life that you have, and you need to do something with that ramp that you have. Hopefully, you're just killing them with the 6-6, six, six, I suppose. I would much rather the the, uh, the opponent discarding and losing life that Croaks is doing. So Uro is just an A. A lowly, measly A. A for Uro, but obviously not quite as good as Croxa's A+. A for Uro, Titan of Nature's Wrath. Our last gold card today before we jump into artifacts and lands is Warden of the Chained. Warden of the Chained is one green red for a creature minotaur warrior at uncommon. It's a 4-4 trample. However, Warden of the Chained can't attack unless you control another creature with power 4 or greater. Are you a beefy red-green deck? If so, this card's just solid. Even if it can't attack yet, it can still block, and when it can attack, it's very, very sizable. I think this is a solid, solid, solid C+, B- minus if it's going to be on almost all the time. Um, at the end of the day, it is just a 4-4 trample, so I don't really think I can you know, jump into the B or B plus range with it. Definitely not the A range, but I think it's just going to be a totally fine B minus as long as this is on almost all of the time. If your creature counts a little bit low, if your power counts a little bit low, it's still probably a C plus. It still blocks really well until you get it turned on, but it's going to be better if you can make sure that this is turned on ASAP and stays turned on. So C plus B minus depends exactly on the deck. That's going to bring us into artifacts. Like I said, there's not too many and they're not very good. Altar of the Pantheon is up first. Altar of the Pantheon is three generic mana for an artifact at common. Your devotion to each color and each combination of colors is increased by one. Tap to add one mana of any color. If you control a god, a demigod, or a legendary enchantment, which are the gods and the demigods and like two other random creatures and that's it, you gain one life. So Devotion's not too, too much of a mechanic in this set, as we've talked about. It's obviously there on Mythics, and it's there on the Demigods, and then it kind of drops off a little bit. So you're not playing this just to get that extra point of Devotion, nor are you playing it for the potential one life a turn while you have a very specific type of card in play. You should play this when you're splashing. Since we are going back to a two-color set from the generally mono-ish color that we had in Throne of Eldraine, you should go back to considering splashing if you have something super powerful. Super quick primer on splashing. Splashing does not mean putting in four or five cards of a different color. It means putting in one card of a different color. Maybe two. If you're playing four cards of a different color, you're not splashing, you're playing a three color deck. But to splash, you typically take a powerful single pip bomb. So you take something that's like four and a black. You put that in your green white deck and you put in three swamps. That way, you're a green-white deck. You're a solid green-white deck, but all you have to do is draw a swamp and draw that bomb card, and suddenly you're a green-white deck with a crazy powerful bomb from a different color. Altar of the Pantheon helps you out because unlike a swamp, Altar of the Pantheon could also tap for your green or for your white mana. And as well, on turn three, it ramps you ahead of mana for the rest of the game. Outside of the two color decks where you're splashing something, I don't think you should be playing Altar of the Pantheon. It's not good ramp in a two color deck. You obviously don't need fixing and nothing else is going on here. So Altar of the Pantheon is a D. It goes in specific decks, those being two colors that are splashing. Or three colors if you're really greedy and brave. Up next is Bronze Sword. Bronze Sword is one generic mana for an artifact equipment at common. Equipped creature gets plus two plus O. Oh, equip for three mana. This is really costly for plus two plus O. Oh. I just don't think you have time in this format to be playing a three mana equip cost. So until I see differently, I don't think this goes in your deck. I think this goes in the gigantic pile of historical bad equipment. So D for Bronze Sword. I'm not going to start playing it. If it was two to equip, or obviously if it was one to equip, I'd certainly be playing it, but at three to equip, it's a D. D for Bronze Sword. 
Up next is Entrancing Liar. Entrancing Liar is three generic mana for an artifact at Uncommon. You may choose not to untap Entrancing Liar during your untap step. Why would you do that? Well, pay X tap, tap target creature with power X or less. It doesn't untap during its controller's untap step for as long as Entrancing Liar remains tapped. So you pay your five mana into this, tap it, tap down a five drop of your opponent's, and it just stays there until you decide otherwise. This card looks really solid. It costs a lot of mana to start, but it's quite powerful. Odds are by the time you've played this and had the mana and your opponent has finally played a threat that is like dangerous to your ability to win the game threat, you probably have the mana to be able to tap it down. And having the choice to potentially move that tap effect around later is really nice. Especially in the scenario that you can easily imagine where your opponent has a scary thing that you've tapped down with Entrancing Liar. It goes to your turn. You choose to untap Entrancing Liar. That creature doesn't untap yet. That creature doesn't untap until your opponent's untap step, meaning that you can actually use Entrancing Liar right then and there to tap a second creature of your opponent's, thereby making them have much less defense and hopefully just ending the game right then and there. So really cool little uh, uh, interaction there. Make sure you're aware of that. I think Entrancing Liar is a B. I think it's great. I think it will definitely be the first pick in some weaker packs. So a B for Entrancing Liar. Up next is Mirror Shield. Mirror, Mirror Shield is two generic mana for an artifact equipment at Uncommon. Equipped creature gets plus O plus two and has hex proof. And whenever a creature with death touch blocks or becomes blocked by this creature, destroy that creature. Equip cost of two. I don't think this is good. It's very costly to give something hexproof and a bigger butt. That's four mana going into it the first time. That said, hexproof is annoying, uh, but you're putting a lot of resources into getting this to make something hexproof. I'm going to die to it, and it's going to be annoying because I won't be able to interact with it. But I do think that I'm just going to win more often than not because an opponent has this card in their deck instead of something real. So I think it's cute flavor, especially with the death touch being reflected onto the death toucher thing. But that's just not going to come up very often either. I think this is a D. I think it's just another piece of equipment that I don't want to play. I'll keep an eye on it, of course, because hexproof can just ruin games. But I I think there's enough uh, uh, resources and downsides and stuff that you have to do poorly to your deck to turn this on that I'm just not going to play it. So D for Mirror Shield. Up next is Nyx Lotus. Nyx Lotus is four generic mana for legendary artifact at rare. Nyx Lotus enters the battlefield tapped. Tap, choose a color, add an amount of mana of that color equal to your devotion to that color. At four mana, I don't think so. For four mana, I need to know that my ramp is A, going to ramp for sure, which this might not, and this comes in tapped. Ugh. Just seems so slow for what I think this format will shape up to be. I do think this format is going to be pretty speedy. Uh, so I'm going to avoid this to start out with. So I've got it at like a D. It's just so expensive. You, you want your ramp to be one mana, two mana. You know, three mana Altar of the Pantheon, we're already starting about not playing it. So for four mana for a Nyx Lotus, I think I'm pretty out. D for Nyx Lotus. Up next is Shadow Spear. Shadow Spear is one generic mana for a legendary artifact equipment at rare. Equipped creature gets plus one, plus one, and has trample and lifelink. Pay one, permanent your opponent's control, lose hexproof and indestructible until end of turn. Equip cost of two. This is okay equipment. Very cheap cast cost, very cheap equip, and three very relevant abilities getting added. It's like Staggering Insight, kind of, except better since if the creature dies, you get to re-equip this. As well, cute little thing, the activated ability, which won't matter in most games, but is nice to have, can be activated even if it's not equipped to a creature. So the spear itself will just sit there and go, ha ha, hexproof goes away. Uh, seems like a fine enough B minus to me. Um, I, I don't know where I'd pick it. I feel like removal's got to be better. And if there is like a balmy on common, I think I might even prefer that over the shadow spear, but maybe shadow spear just keeps you open a little bit more. We'll see what happens when that decision comes up in a draft, but let's start shadow spear at a B minus. Up next is Soul Guide Lantern. Soul Guide Lantern is one generic mana for an artifact at Uncommon. When Soul Guide Lantern enters the battlefield, exile target card from a graveyard. Tap and sacrifice it. Exile each opponent's graveyard. Or pay one tap and sack it. Draw a card. So it's one generic mana to remove a single card from presumably an opponent's graveyard. That's like a sideboard card at absolute best. And then you can tap it to exile their graveyard. That's still a sideboard card only. Or you can pay one tap it to draw a card. 
I'm not in the market for paying two mana to draw a card for a card. That's just not something that I want. And I don't think these effects are good enough for you to main deck this just because you can draw a card if they're not relevant. I think you keep this in your sideboard. If you're up against blue, black or black green or somebody's really doing something with their graveyard, side this in and it's gonna be really good, but otherwise keep it in the sideboard. So D plus for Soul Guide Lantern. Up next is Thaumaturge's Familiar. Thaumaturge's Familiar is three generic mana for an artifact creature bird at common. It's a 1-3 flyer, and when it enters the battlefield, it scries one. 1-3 one, flyers for three aren't my jam. That's pretty costly, and it takes a lot of time for them to actually, you know, have some sort of real impact. They block okay, but not amazingly, and scrying one just isn't really worth it either for me. So I think Thaumaturge's Familiar is definitely in the like C minus range. It's a creature that if you have to, you'll play it, but you should probably cut it pretty reliably. Thundering Chariot is up next. Thundering Chariot is four generic mana for an artifact vehicle like an uncommon. It's a 3-3 with first strike, trample, and haste, and crew one. This might be the best non-rare vehicle we've seen in a long time. It's not amazing by any stretch of the imagination, which is great, because if you weren't around for the first time vehicles came in, they were messed up. And Watsy knows that, and they have been weak because of that. Um, this is starting to get a little bit into the scarier territory. Four mana is what's going to keep me from giving this something in the B range, but I think this is a C plus. Crew cost of one is really, really, really easy to pay, and it's a three-three first strike trample haste, which means it technically attacks as though it's a three-four because three threes can't block this; they just die. The haste is nice because it just comes down and can immediately be crewed and attacked. It, this card just looks good. It looks like a strong C+. I think I'm going to start in every deck that isn't, you know, controly or not planning on just attacking. Uh, I think I'm going to include this. So let's start Thundering Chariot at a C+. I don't think it's going to go any higher. There's a chance it could go lower, but I think C+, is about correct for Thundering Chariot. Our second last artifact for today is Traveler's Amulet. Traveler's Amulet is back. It's one generic mana for an artifact at common. Pay one, sacrifice it, search your library for a basic land card, reveal it, put it into your hand, and then shuffle your library. Traveler's Amulet is a nice little card, much like uh, uh, Altar of the Pantheon. It's a card that's going to go into your two color with a splash deck or your three color decks if you're feeling brave like that. In a two color deck, it's not really justified. The effect of thinning your deck is wildly overstated, so there's no real need to ever put this into your two-color deck. But if you're splashing, it's gonna be a very nice little pickup. It's something that the second you think you're gonna do that, you're gonna to wanna to keep your eyes open for this, and you're gonna take this over anything else that is, you know, filler to filler plus level. You're obviously not taking this over bombs or over removal or stuff like that, stuff that you would miss in your deck. But uh, you do want to pick one of these up the second you know you're splashing. So it's like a strong D plus, strong D plus for Traveler's Amulet. Our last artifact for today is Wings of Hubris. Wings of Hubris is two generic mana for an artifact equipment at common. Equipped creature has flying. Sacrifice Wings of Hubris. Equipped creature can't be blocked this turn. Sacrifice it at the beginning of the next end step. Equip cost of one. Absolutely zero interest in this card. We've had various versions of equipment that gives flying and, and some of them even gave power boosts and they've never ever been good and this one's not going to be good either two mana to cast it one mana to equip it finally your creature has flying meanwhile your opponent's been establishing the board killing your stuff actually playing real cards this just feels like you know we're, we're doing ancient greek stuff we better do icarus somehow let's do icarus's wings here we go we did it haha ha, hurrah I'm never playing this card. I think it's like a D minus. Uh, I think if you are desperate, if you just have nothing better to do and you're in like a beefy green deck, you can put this in to hopefully try to fly your big five fives and stuff over your opponent. But your five fives typically can just walk through to your opponent. They don't need to fly. So this would be much better served being any other card. D minus for Wings of Hubris. Moving on to lands, and then we're going to wrap it up for the day. The first land we're going to look at is Field of Ruin. Field of Ruin is a landed on common. Tap it to add a colorless to your mana pool. Pay two, tap, and sack it. Destroy target non-basic land that opponent controls. Each player searches their library for a basic land card, puts it onto the battlefield, then shuffles their library. Nope, not for limited. You don't want this. There's no reason to have colorless mana. That's just going to hurt your mana base. And there are 
not really any non-basics that your opponent's going to have that you want to blow up. You're not going to blow up their field of ruin. You're not going to blow up their temples. You're not going to blow up their labyrinth, probably. And you're not going to blow up their uh, unknown shores. So this card is an F. You just should never, ever put it in your deck. It is in this set purely for standard, and that is it. F for field of ruin. Up next is Labyrinth of Scophos. Labyrinth of Scophos is a land at rare. Tap it to add colorless to your mana pool. Pay four, tap it, remove target attacking or blocking creature from combat. So it's like Maze of Ith, except you have to pay a whole lot to activate it, but it taps for a mana, which does make it better than Maze of Ith in that case. And of course you might have Scophos Maze Warden, which actually cares about this specific land. If you have Scophos Maze Warden, I can see an argument for putting this in your deck, but it is kind of like a miser's include, right? It's an uncommon Scophos Maze Warden. This is a rare. You're probably only going to have one of those Maze Wardens. You have to draw this. You have to draw the Maze Warden. So it's unlikely to really, you know, go off with this. So I think we basically only rate this for the actual text on this card. And the text on this card is fine, but four mana is an awful lot to pay. Five mana, technically, because you have to tap this land as well, and it could have produced mana. That's putting us in the spinning wheel area, except spinning wheel could tap for any color. So I don't know. I think this card's probably okay, but I'm going to have to play with it to see how good it is. My instinct is that it's around like the C plus range. I don't think it's going to be in the Bs, but it could go as high as a B minus. So I'll have to play with it to get a real handle on it. So C plus B minus for Labyrinth of Scophos. Up next, we have the other five temples that we did not have in M20. We have Temple of Abandon, Temple of Deceit, Temple of Enlightenment, Temple of Malice, and Temple of Plenty. All of these are rare lands that enter the battlefield tapped. When they enter the battlefield, they scry one, and they tap to add one mana of uh, their two colors. So Abandon, for example, taps for a red or a green. These are totally okay. If you are in a two-color deck, they are going to be perfect. I will play these if they are off color. So for example, if I'm in red, black, I will play a Temple of Abandon just as a mountain that comes in tapped because the scry one's a pretty nice little bonus. And of course, if you're splashing, they're gonna be pretty handy as well. I could play Temple of Abandon in my red, black deck uh, where I'm splashing a green card. These are around like the C plus level. They are definitely not a high pick. You should basically pick anything above filler over these cards. So C plus for the temples. We know how they work. Not much else to say about them. Our last card for the entire set review is Unknown Shores. Unknown Shores is a land at common. Tap to add one colorless mana to your mana pool or pay one tap and add one mana of any color. If you are playing a two color deck and splashing for a third color, you do not want to be playing this card. You want to be playing Altar of the Pantheon. You want to be playing green with Elysian Carry added or with the Dryad of the Elysian Grove. You want to be playing a Traveler's Amulet or a Temple. You do not want to be playing on known shores. This is the literal last choice for splashing. The reason for that is because this does not help you fix that well. This costs you a mana because you have to tap this land as well. And that is very, 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 very costly to fix your mana. This is like a D minus. This is your last choice if you're splashing. Don't go for this. We've seen Unknown Shores. We've seen various cards of this uh, uh, style before, and they've never been the way that you want to splash. So a very weak D minus. Please trust me here. There's so many better ways to splash up to and possibly including just playing three basic lands of the color that you're splashing. Unknown Shores is not good. D minus for Unknown Shores. So that's going to wrap it up for all of the gold artifact and land cards. We went a little bit longer because, of course, those gold cards have a whole lot of text and a whole lot of stuff to talk about. But we made it. We're done. Theros Beyond Death set review is over, which means it's time to start the Theros Beyond Death release content. Tomorrow, Wednesday, January 15th, over on twitch.tv slash themanaleek at around 2.30 Eastern Standard Time, I will be starting my Theros Early Access stream. I'll be playing a whole bunch of Theros Best of One Sealed on Arena tomorrow. Thank you very much to Wizards of the Coast for inviting me to that once again. Following that, I will have my usual pre-release vlog recap on the weekend. I am vaguely considering checking out a new store. Friday night? I don't think I will, but that might be on the horizon. We'll see. And then Theros Pack One Pick One videos will start, followed by Spiky Saturdays with Theros for the next few months. 
So make sure you stick around for all that. As always, if you do have any questions, comments, or suggestions, you can find me over on Twitter, Twitch, and Facebook. You can find me at patreon.com slash manaleek. If you want to become a backer that way and help out, get access to the Discord, earn your way towards getting a Manaleek playmat shipped out to you, and also get in for the uh, the weekly draws on the pack one pick one cards. Of course, the easiest way to help out is to like, share, and subscribe. But if you do have questions, comments, or suggestions, let me know. Otherwise, see y'all next time.